Hi, I'm Jim Grossman, Executive Director of the American Historical Association. Thank you for tuning in to this presentation about findings from the AHA's Mapping the Landscape of Secondary U.S. History Education Research Project. We initially broadcast this presentation live on March 14th during Civic Learning Week. Due to technical issues that compromised the audio, we opted to re-record the session before posting it online. This gave us the opportunity to consider the more than 70 questions that came in during and after our presentation. It also gave us the opportunity to respond to thoughtful suggestions in the same manner as the revision of a conference paper when it moves from live presentation to publication. This is what historians do when we speak and publish. This includes an expanded Q&A session that has allowed our presenters to respond to more of the excellent questions that we did not have time to address during the Civic Learning Week live event. We appreciate your patience and understanding, and I extend my thanks to Nick, Witt, Scott, and Katerina for recording this presentation and the Q&A twice. The purpose of this research has been to establish a factual basis for the contentious debate over history education that has attracted attention from state legislators, school boards, parents, and media across the country. Perhaps too much attention, as there is far more heat than light. The AHA will release a full report this fall, and this is one of a series of publications focused on sharing preliminary findings from two years of exhaustive research. This presentation is part of AHA Learn, a series of online programs that provide a forum for compelling ideas and important conversations in history education. Our research team will present some of its results in a 25-minute presentation, after which they'll answer questions received during and after a live presentation of their report. The discussion will be moderated by Katerina Metro, who teaches world and US history at Walter Johnson High School in Bethesda, Maryland, and is a former member of the American Historical Association's Governing Council. Metro holds an MA from the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and a PhD in Central European History from Stanford University. And now I will turn it over to Katarina. Thank you, Jim. I'm also going to say a few introductory ver words about the Mapping the Landscape project because I'm particularly excited about this project as a classroom teacher. So the mapping project was conceived about two years ago when the first round of divisive concepts le legislation was making their way through state legislatures. As policymakers were fretting about children being indoctrinated with critical race theory in the history classroom, and others worried that they were being fed an overly positive or celebratory narrative of American history, a team of AHA researchers set out to study what was actually going on inside history classrooms in this country. After a year and a half of interviewing administrators, surveying teachers, coding state legislation, and surveying district-level history curricula, these researchers will share some of their preliminary findings with you today. I am very excited to hear what they found because as a high school social studies teacher, I have always felt strangely left out of these very heated debates about what supposedly goes on inside my classroom. In fact, my own friends from graduate school sometimes interrogate me about my lessons, suggesting that they think they know exactly about all of the different things I'm doing wrongly and that I should do differently when I'm pretty sure that they haven't set foot in a high school history classroom since their own high school graduation. 
So today we will hear from people who have talked to teachers and who have heard and seen and read about what history teachers actually do. We are going to have um, a Q&A after the presentation. And I, before we get started with our presentation, I'm going to um, introduce our mapping uh, the landscape staff. First, we have Nick Kritschka, who is the research coordinator for the American Historical Association's Mapping the Landscape of Secondary U.S. History Education Project and a scholar in residence at the Newberry Library in Chicago. Nick earned his PhD in history at the University of Chicago, where he also worked as a postdoctoral teaching fellow in the social sciences. Previously, Nick taught high school social studies for 10 years in the Chicago public schools. Whit Berenger is a researcher for the AHA's Mapping the Landscape of Secondary History Education Project. She earned her BA from the University of Central Arkansas and her MA and PhD from the University of Mississippi. She taught within the University of Central Arkansas's Norbert O. Shedler Honors College and the History Department for five years. Scott McFarlane is a researcher for the AHA's Mapping the Landscape of Secondary History Education Project as well. Prior to joining the AHA, Scott taught, taught history at the collegiate and high school level, served as an inaugural research scholar for Historic New England's Recovering New England's Voices Initiative, and founded the Oxbow History Company. He received a PhD in American history from Columbia University. And I'm gonna hand it over to the mapping team. Great, thank you, uh, Katarina, and thank you, Jim, um, for the introduction as well. Uh, we, uh, all three of us, are very excited to share this work with everyone assembled here for Civic Learning Week. Uh, to set the scene, um, I think it's important to get a sense of what was being said, uh, as Katarina um, about American social studies classrooms at the turn of the 2020s when the idea for this research project first emerged. Um, on the one hand, were political progressives who claimed that the typical U.S. history classroom was a whitewashed fable that suppressed uncomfortable truths about slavery and race. And on the other hand, were cons movement conservatives who claimed the opposite, that uh, educators swept up in a hypercritical obsession with race now taught children to hate their country. Uh, and as Jim explained, our research goal was simple in a certain sense, to see whether either of these claims had any basis in truth. And to get an answer, uh, we had to start by being clear about how curricular decision-making works in the United States. Contrary to what pundits and activists sometimes imply, there's of course no one place that these decisions are made. There are 50 sets of state standards, 13,000 local school districts, some 90,000 uh, schoolhouses, and hundreds of thousands of teachers making decisions about what's taught every day. So obviously, since we couldn't study them all, we took an approach where we could tell a story about how these layers of decision-making actually interact, combining an appraisal of state-level standards and legislation in all 50 states with a deep dive to a sample of nine regionally representative states, which we colored in on the map here, where we fielded a survey with over 3,000 teachers, interviewed hundreds or teachers and administrators and asked them to share their curriculum with us. Uh, partners in this work included the National Opinion Research University of Chicago, who fielded our survey, and the National Council for the Social Studies, who helped connect us with educators nationwide. And as, as many of you will correctly guess, most teachers are not running headlong toward either of the polarized takes on American history that I described a moment ago. Uh, and in fact, with the exception of some definite hotspots, teachers don't regularly face politicized pressure at their job. Only 2% of teachers we surveyed say that they regularly face criticism related to the way that they teach topics in U.S. history. 40% say they've probably encountered an objection only once or twice in their career. And 44% have never encountered an objection to anything they've taught. So far from fending off throngs of energized and, uh, and oppositional Many social studies teachers struggle to get parents, students, and even administrators to care about history at all. So what explains the disconnect between this thrumming culture war in our news feeds and the far less contentious instructional environments that most teachers and students actually experience? 
or put in terms of our research questions. How are teachers actually told what to teach in US history? What do teachers actually use when they teach US history? And ultimately, what's being taught about US history? So to the first question of how teachers are told what to teach, there are indeed some patterns that we can see from the national bird's eye. Uh, since the 1990s, state and local education agencies have been pulled into successive waves of standardization on a number of fronts. Language arts and mathematics were always the primary targets, but social studies became a collateral recipient of attention anytime uh, a new round of standards and assessment rolled across the landscape. By 2002, all but two states had a set of social studies standards. Some had initiated assessment programs and others were making promises to do the same. Uh, assessment actually landed unevenly and sometimes only temporarily in the social studies world. Bold plans to test everyone and everything were often abandoned before they started. A common statewide exam that assesses U.S. history content can exert a very strong aligning force on curriculum, but only 16 states have a mandate to that effect. A handful of other states have a mandate to test on the books, but all the details are determined locally. The general trend is, in fact, away from standardized testing in social studies, with a number of more recent laws scaling back or removing assessment mandates in history. Following the interruption of the COVID-19 pandemic, accountability rit rituals have been slow to reassert themselves or have often uh, emerged in a less rigid form. So we might call this a kind of uh, accountability light, uh, which isn't such a bad place to be, but teachers give mixed signals about these conditions. Uh, in interviews, teachers consistently cite social studies low priority status as compared with other subjects. We've heard terms like back burner or afterthought or redheaded stepchild a number of times with teachers. A couple of teachers in states without testing even wished that history would be tested if only to boost its clout with their administrators. When teachers don't like the standards, they don't hide their opinions. Teachers will complain about standards that are too overwhelming in their detailed lists of trivia, such as this one, uh, as well as those that are so broad and abstract that they seem to describe nothing at all. Now, some of the national similarities we see in history teaching go back far longer in time than the accountability movement. Uh, patterns of course sequencing by grade level, for instance, uh, developed in the early 20th century have proved remarkably durable. Uh, in this color-coded visualization of courses of study for US and state history across all 50 states, we can see this very clear, clear clumping of coursework and content across common grade bands. And this pattern of state history sometime between kindergarten and fourth grade, US history in fifth grade, eighth grade, and again in high school, often in, in junior year, uh, that pattern is as clear today as it was to a team of AHA researchers who studied the terrain uh, 80 years ago. But back to this question at hand uh, of how teachers are told what to teach, uh, each layer of that American education system, the state, the district, the schoolhouse, and the classroom, needs to be appreciated to answer this. And as foreshadowed by our teacher comments about uh, testing, the presence of a state-mandated assessment exerts a strong influence on local conditions, um, creating both the rationale for more staffing, uh, more paperwork, and more interim testing. Uh, the annual Texas STAR test, for example, makes it way more likely that a mid-sized Texas district will have a designated social studies curriculum coordinator than in other states. Uh, and this data point is a really clear illustration of the force of testing. 74% of surveyed teachers in Texas report giving a common test along with their colleagues on their course team every unit, uh, where while only 33% across all the other states report a similar condition. So the, the founding myth of the Texas accountability movement that a principal could uh, hear a teacher begin a sentence in one classroom and then walk across the hall to hear their colleague finish it in another, this was probably never true anywhere. But Texas administrators can more plausibly expect that teachers stick to materials that they've told them to use. Now, in the absence of assessment, state agencies have limited leverage over local curricular decisions. While some enterprising state social studies specialists will curate crowdsourced online hubs of instructional content, state documents strategically disavow the word curriculum, referring to state produced materials with a series of euphemisms instead. Now, this does not mean that district level 
administrators are necessarily more empowered to shape curriculum. In many cases, a district level curriculum coordinator may be in charge of multiple subject areas and have no background in history. Uh, very few survey teachers said that their district requires anything beyond pacing, and more than a third of survey teachers said that they don't receive anything at all from their district that directs their teaching. In rural districts, even fewer teachers say that they receive any district paperwork, and you can see that high percentage of no district uh, guidance um, on the left. Um, Uh, in cities and suburbs, more teachers report more district oversight, which you can see in a very clear contrast on the right. Larger and better resource districts grow heavier bureaucracies, and in some cases, an ambition for more top-down control. Though it should be said that many district administrators that we've spoken with are reluctant to claim that these are being followed with any kind of uh, fidelity. You can, uh, especially at the high school level, you can see here the many confessions by school administrators about the limits of their authority. Uh, many teachers, it seems, even in states where they don't have labor union protections, feel comfortable ignoring or resisting many efforts to align curriculum. Interestingly, in districts where the recent culture wars have popped off, administrators have seen an opportunity to strengthen their hand over instructional materials. Comments like this were common. We told teachers in this world of controversy over what we're teaching, one thing, if you want to ensure we're on your side, always use our materials. Ultimately, classroom teachers are still decisive curricular policy makers. The most commonly referenced resource among surveyed teachers was materials that I design and write myself. Now, this isn't the same as working alone, of course. Uh, at the schoolhouse and the course team level, teachers commonly work together, both by choice and by force, and with a clear trend toward increasing expectations by administrators that teachers align themselves to each other on course level teams or so-called uh, professional learning communities. Um, still, the substance and depth of these uh, collaborations are quite uneven from place to place, and social studies departments are best seen as lesson sharing ecosystems rather than structures of command and control. Uh, so to move on to our next section, I'm gonna pass things to my colleague, uh, Scott. Thanks, Nick. So what do teachers actually use when they teach? Just a few years ago, the question might've been answered by pointing to a short stack of history textbooks from four or five publishers. Educational publishing is still big business, but traditional textbooks are unlikely to stand at the center of history instruction. Over 30% of teachers surveyed say they never use a textbook, and those that do are far more likely to describe them as a reference than something that they expect students to read regularly in class or for homework. When asked the name of the textbook they had available, many teachers couldn't recall the name. In our survey, teachers who recall their textbook named the usual suspect. The eclipse of textbooks reflects the advent of digital learning management systems, open educational resources, and a relentless push for one-to-one -one ratio of computing devices to students. EdTech startups and nonprofits now elbow into the marketplace alongside legacy publishing houses. Content aggregation and curation service Newzilla is by far the most recognized paid resource among survey teachers. The Discovery Education Social Studies textbook in second place. Punching above its weight as a social studies specific vendor is the influential DBQ project, a small publisher whose units we found in multiple places. For teachers, as much as anyone else, free is the magic word, of course. 75% of survey teachers so they make use of no cost materials from a decentralized online universe. In interviews, some teachers know their favorites right away, others pause in bewilderment, realizing they weren't always sure where the materials they used had come from. As measured by our survey, teachers appear to trust materials that come from federal museums, archives, and institutions. After that, the list of repeatedly used US history freebies begins with two names that most non-history teachers won't recognize, Sam Weinberg and John Green. These two are the real influencers. So who are these characters? Weinberg is a cognitive psychologist and emeritus professor of education whose two-decade-old Stanford History Education Group, now known as Digital Inquiry Group, has shown up at every level of our research. State websites link to it, district recurrent recommend it, and teachers in interviews will simply say, I use a lot of shag. 
Among those that have heard of it, JEG attracts repeated use and a loyal following, but its reach is not universal. That state-by-state -state variation is visible here. As for John Green, he's a young adult fiction author and YouTuber whose Crash Course US History webisode series launched in 2013 is cited as an often used resource by more of our survey teachers than any other single digital resource. A smaller set of teachers find Green's snarky quick cut style too fast for the kids to follow or too annoying to put up with. While Crash Course and Shag may have loyal followings, a number of other resources fall in the category of widely recognized and occasionally used. PBS, National Geographic, Khan Academy, Teaching History.org, the Gilder Lerman Institute of American History, all made strong showings in our survey. In what we might call a polarized reaction, there was one extremely well-recognized resource, Teachers Pay Teachers. In one camp, or 61% of teachers who said they use Teachers Pay Teachers, about 36% either don't use it or purposely avoid it. The quotations here show the variety of reactions that Teachers Pay Teachers provokes, with many teachers feeling quite strongly they should neither pay nor be paid for these kinds of resources. And now I'll hand it over to Wit. Okay, so let's talk now about what's being taught. As we've hopefully made clear, an array of forces compete to determine the shape of US history curriculum. State legislators, state agency officials, district curriculum specialists, professional associations, like educational publishers, local parents, all while teachers prefer, would prefer to be left in charge of the details. In a U.S. history class, the details, what gets emphasized and what gets minimized, is an expression of those competing forces, but with a heavy dose of individual preference. We asked teachers which topics and eras were top priorities for coverage, and we asked them which were their favorites to teach. The answers to favorites are visible here. Show clear, these show clear points of common emphasis, the revolution, the civil war, World War II, and the civil rights movement. Seen from one perspective, we might read this as a playlist of America's greatest hits, rejecting monarchy, abolishing slavery, fighting Nazis, and ending Jim Crow. But inevit inevitable triumph is, isn't the note that teachers strike when they say why they love these topics. Some teachers certainly cite the value of learning about heroes and heroics, but others stress the notion that these events were exciting, dramatic turning points, that they were full of contradictory and complicated politics, and that something about what Americans are today can't be understood without understanding these past events. This is a crucial point for all of us to take in. This picture doesn't square with either of the partisan caricatures that tend to dominate media of the so-called history wars. On the one hand, kids aren't only learning stories that glorify the nation. Slavery, one of these hot button topics, is described as a priority topic by 93% of surveyed teachers and is not being erased from curriculum. On the other hand, teachers are not engaged in liberal indoctrination or racial scapegoating. 94% of surveyed teachers see the history classroom as preparation for informed citizenship. In our research, we've collected and appraised materials from every level and every type of document imaginable, so long as we could determine one of two things. It was either something someone actually used or something someone was told to use. There is very little consistency in format across these artifacts. We got everything from lists of primary source readings to curriculum maps, assessments, published lesson plans, entire digital course modules, and even personal PowerPoints. For all materials we collected, we focused our rubric on six topics. Native American history, the founding era, westward expansion, slavery, the Civil War, and Reconstruction, industry, capital, and labor, and the Civil Rights Movement. These are all topics that fall within the standard span of U.S. history have been known to provoke politicized controversy, or have been perceived by historians as areas where there is likely to be a lag or gap between scholarly consensus and broader public knowledge. In all cases, we intended our appraisals to be part of a constructive description of meaningful patterns, not a celebration or indictment of any individual teacher, district, curriculum developer, or state education agency. So here's the very quick tour. Native American history, 
is the most likely of our topics to blur into generalities, transforming into a kind of therapeutic civics where Indian tragedies serve as set pieces for present day contemplations of social justice. One of the most powerful antidotes to these tendencies is the required study of state and local history, which forces curriculum into more textured treatments of Native Americans as local peoples with complex politics, diverse cultures, and rooted histories in particular places. In the founding era, the most popular favorite among teachers, the best materials that we've seen capture the multiple perspectives, contingent decisions, and escalating misunderstandings that took British colonists from resistance to rebellion. Many activities ask students to put themselves in the position of a colonist at various stages of the conflict, Great opportunities to historicize and dramatize the decision making that drove important events. But there's also a deep well of untapped opportunities for teachers to lend that same sense of drama to the disruptions and decisions that non elites faced during the revolutionary moment. As for the topic of westward expansion, an overemphasis on the concept of manifest destiny often misses the contingency of how settlement occurred locally and for a wide range of reasons. In materials that resist the simplification, lessons ground history in specific and relevant details, telling stories of individual tribes, immigrants, or workers, sometimes using the local landscapes that students live in. The study of slavery and the Civil War are both ranked as high priority topics by survey teachers with prominent characters like Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass at the center of the story. There is no serious controversy about slavery's central role as the cause of the Civil War. In units on Reconstruction, we find some teachers asking students to do their deepest thinking about life under slavery as they assess how post-Civil War policy succeed, succeeded or failed freed people. In some locales, unfortunately, pressure from multiple sides feeds anxiety among teachers. Conservative activists have chosen to mistake any discussion of slavery for critical race theory, while other parents complain that there's too much talk about slavery and not enough about African American achievements. Our look at industry, capital, and labor, focused on the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, reveals that teachers strain to cover the wide range of action industrialization, immigration, urbanization, reform, overseas interventions that marked the time period. Prominent industrialists like Andrew Carnegie often stand in for complex phenom phenomena, shining a light on corporate business models and philanthropy, but leaving regional histories of industry, immigration, and labor unionism and their interdependent development in the shadows. Finally, in the civil rights movement, major plot points and main characters appear consistent, like Martin Luther King Jr., Brown v. Board of Education, and the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And in some cases, the focus on the Southern campaign and its legal achievements constitute the extent of coverage. But a number of standards and curriculum appear to be expanding their treatment of the era in the same way that historical scholarship has, reaching backward to include earlier struggles for civil rights downward to reveal history at the grassroots, and outward to encompass the range of other groups whose struggles for rights followed closely in the wake of the classic narrative. In general, we find that K-12 coverage of American history is not riddled with distortions or omissions. When materials fall short, it's usually because of simplification rather than any partisan agenda. Indeed, Teachers are clear and consistent on this point. Authority in the social classroom starts with a political poker face. Preparing students for critical thinking and informed citizenship, the top educational goals among surveyed teachers, appears to require at least the performance of neutrality. This is particularly good news to hear during Civic Learning Week. You can see teacher statements on these commitments here. Activists who imagine educators as eager soldiers in cultural warfare have greatly misjudged their audience. And now I'll hand it back to Nick. Great. Thank you, Whit. Um, 
So to conclude, you know, we feel to the need to add that this generally good news uh, that we're relating uh, does not mean that threats to the integrity of good history teaching don't exist or that all that we see in state standards and local curricula is praiseworthy. Uh, and indeed, the political polarization of the past decade has spun out some troubling emphases and evasions uh, in both red and blue flavors. Um, in some uh, red uh, or conservative locales, teachers find themselves bullied uh, and spooked away from perfectly good lessons by the rolling threat of conservative activists. In Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Texas, we heard from educators with direct experience with Moms for Liberty or other similar groups, which they described as an exhausting thorn in their side, or in some cases, something even more threatening. Uh, state laws banning so-called divisive concepts, which are now on the books in several states, these have clearly sent a chilling effect rolling through some localities. In Iowa, for example, uh, the state education agency sent out what we would consider helpful guidance to teachers to make clear that teachers should not interpret that state's divisive concepts law as prohibiting them from teaching or discussing the history of slavery, racism, and segregation as they always have. But the chill had already set in with some local administrators encouraging their teachers to uh, use primary documents or student discussion in place of their own teacher voice when covering so-called difficult subject matter. And this struck us as very bad advice. Uh, this is seemed to be saying, use inquiry style pedagogy so that you're not caught uh, on the record teaching the history directly. Uh, teachers in some blue enclaves a cringe as progressives demand that perfectly good history curricula be revised in the name of racial equity. A relatively new species of document, uh, the equity audit or anti-racism toolkit or bias rubric, among other names, has popped up in many blue districts. And in the hands of a thoughtful administrator, these have actually been used constructively uh, to update curricula that were lacking in content on Native American or African American history, uh, for instance. But we also spoke to teachers uh, struggling amidst uh, aggressive administrative pushes for social justice style anti-racism, efforts that they called performative at best uh, and stifling at worst. Uh, in Washington state, for example, teachers interpreted a widely used anti-bias ru rubric as prohibiting them from covering material from the 19th century unless they were constantly and intentionally calling out the injustices of the era. Uh, and this also struck us as very bad advice. It seemed to say that one should only teach history if it allows you to confirm your current moral commitments. Now, as we said at the outset, however, uh, these extremes do not represent the average experience of most teachers. Outside of more affluent corridors where parents have the time to devote themselves to one side or another of the culture war, parents are too busy or uninterested to hammer their kids' history teachers with objections. For those of us trying to work with teachers to develop curricular resources and professional development, we actually think this current moment offers us a, a unique opportunity to clarify what it is that's exciting and unique about history and what it can contribute to what we might call civic dispositions. Ultimately, what, teacher, what history teachers teach their students about, which is to say cause and consequence, structure and agency, context and complexity, contingency and continuity, uh, these are ways of thinking about how societies work and how change happens. Um, in other words, great civic tools. Uh, but they are concepts that bear very little, little resemblance to what partisan culture warriors argue about, uh, something more like who we are as a nation and how we should feel about it. The former trains the mind for judgment and the latter for propaganda. And we're confident that all sides should agree which one we want for our school children. Thanks. Thank you all for a really um, exciting and interesting presentation. This is making me look forward to uh, reading uh, the final report once you've had ch a chance to uh, get through all of your research uh, in the coming months. Um, we're going to start with the q a i have a few questions for you that i would like to ask and then uh, we have consolidated all the many many questions that we got uh during the live webinar from our audience members and 
we are getting a chance to get to some of the questions that we didn't get to during the live uh, presentation now. My first question is, can you remember when you started on this research, what you were expecting to find? And you must have had a set of expectations. Uh, and then now looking back on it, which of your findings did you find most surprising? Well, I'll say I joined Whit and Nick only last summer, so I was came in the middle of it, but I, I found it so surprising how teachers uh, accept the management of their their teaching. It's in one place where teachers will say, well, I'm sure glad that I'm, I'm free to teach um, without any um, control over what I'm doing in the classroom. And then you'll go to the setting that they kind of describe and the teachers there will say, well, I too have complete liberty to teach and that I'm not being really managed in any way that feels uh, intrusive. And so interesting sort of theory of management that has played itself out in our, our research. Yeah, um, I would say that, I, you know, when I came into this project, I imagine there to be some, you know, some kind of governing body that, you know, made, made uh, suggestions or comments on what social studies, education, uh, how it should be shaped. Um, but I was really surprised to find as much legislation as we have across all 50 states that affects um, the, the teaching of social studies um, that are offering some comment on what should be taught and more recently what shouldn't uh, be taught um, by law. And uh, But then also to see variations in the level of detail, that there's variations from state to state, but then to still find generally speaking, that there are similarities amongst what teachers teach, regardless of um, what's on, what's on, uh, what legislation has been passed. So it's been really interesting to just explore that kind of body of, of literature of, about, you know, what should be taught in social studies education and seeing, like, exactly how, how does it affect classroom? Yeah, I would, I would say, I, I think what, what surprised me, um, and, and this is, Partially because I was a I was a high school social studies teacher and and finished my time in the classroom in 2013 and so in the you know the little over a decade uh, of the time that had passed between then and now I was surprised about how substantially textbooks had moved to the margins of teaching uh, and you know they were already you know in in the time that I taught certainly not central to instruction in a lot of ways and there were a lot of complaints about you know, boring textbooks or ineffective textbooks, but that what's happened since 2013 um, and teachers share this with us is not just kind of a dissatisfaction with the textbook, but also a frustration with uh, teachers read of what students can handle. So the inability of students to persist uh, in reading at length or to read read critically. And, uh, you know, many teachers will talk about the influence of uh, phone based so social media uh, as as being a big part of that. So that was that was, you know, historically a really important thing for us to notice, I think. Thank you. Um, I had another question that I think comes up naturally, given the title of your talk and, and the nature of your research. Uh, which is about the divisive concepts legislation on the books. Um, in February, the RAND Corporation just published a survey of educators in the country, according to which two thirds of teachers in the country have self-censored or have, quote, limited discussions of political and social issues in their classrooms. It sounds like from your research that th you didn't come across this issue maybe quite as much, but I'm still curious to hear um, are you worried about this type of self-censoring? Is this going to get worse? What do teachers share with you? And and do you think, uh, can organizations like the AHIA help teachers with that? Yeah, I, I think it, it, it's a really important distinction to make, you know, between some of the, the good news data that we shared, which is that, yeah, most teachers aren't kind of constantly fending off objections to what they teach. That's a different question than than what you're getting at, which is, are there ways in which the political climate makes teachers second guess 
as before anybody even raises an objection about how they might cover a so-called sensitive issue. Um, and I think there is evidence of that, um, and it's troubling. You know, the two vignettes that we shared at the very end of the presentation are meant to demonstrate exactly that, that, that even whether it's an administrator or a legislator uh, designing a certain uh, policy, that uh, they are not necessarily aware of what that can do in the rumor mill that exists uh, among educators. So the power of rumor to spread through a teacher community and then persuade some people that there is something that they can't teach or that they need to be careful about teaching, um, that, that, that can be really poisonous. Um, and we would also add, I think, that um, panic can be poisonous to how people decide to help support teachers in these moments. So um, we think that it's not a constructive thing to declare a crisis um, about certain topics among teachers uh, because that panic, uh, rather than stealing people with you know, uh, confidence and courage to defend the integrity of their teaching, will cause that similar chilling effect to, to multiply. Um, so I, I think it's really important to, to double down on the integrity of the content itself. Um, rather than thinking about what what you're fighting, uh, what you're kind of panicked about uh, against. Thank you. Um, I have yet another question of my own. Um, given that this presentation is happening during Civic Learning Week, um, it raises the question to me about the fact that history is so often assumed to have a civic function. I think Witt mentioned in her presentation that many teachers consider history education as preparation for informed citizenship, even though we have other classes in most curricula that are called civics or government. How do you think about history in this context? Or put another way, what's civic about teaching and learning US history? Thanks for the question. I think part of the answer is that history helps students understand the world as it is rather than as they might want it to be. And I think you can see that modeled in our own project where the three of us, we have differing perspectives and ideas, but we haven't just observed, analyzed, and described. We've, we've made some stronger claims. So when we say, the next thing like, don't panic, or when we say, let teachers think for themselves, that's rooted in the civic purpose of social studies, which is to have inform thoughtful citizens which regardless of whether they're getting a more of a liberty or justice theme depending on what kind of district they're they're going to school and it's only through modeling that thoughtful engagement with history that stated and widely shared civic goals of social studies can be met yeah um you know it's it's really clear that teachers take their mission to prepare students very for citizenship very seriously. Um, and this has long been a rational rationale for um, history education in American history. But what it means to be a citizen is highly dependent on who is defining it. Um, and it's extraordinarily easy for the teacher who is passive or unengaged or untrained or otherwise motivated to slip from civic education to patriotic education to and from there to nationalism and to other ideologies. Um, and so thus, you know, civics questions in the history classroom ironically can become tools for ideologies generally deemed corrosive to democracy and civic culture. So um, studying history, I believe, creates a historical consciousness while studying civics creates a civic consciousness, which are two different things. Democratically minded students come from culturally democratic environments. So if we endeavor to create kind of this, a holistic and democratic civics education without any appeals to you know, patriotism, nationalism, exceptionality, then it should be, I think, separated from history. Or, or, or Well, I mean, that is the question. Should it be? Um, separated from U.S. history, where it colors how students value and understand uh, the factual and usable past. So rather than assuming civics belongs in history, is it time to wholly reimagine how civics fits into the overall curriculum 
Um, perhaps asking what kind of civics lessons we should be teaching in our history classrooms is the wrong question. And maybe we should be asking, uh, you know, whether civics belongs in history at all to get closer to the heart of the matter. Yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll add to that, you know, Witt's point about the, the, the longstanding civic uh, tradition within U.S. history teaching, um, you know, you, you really see that in the fact that there's a political um, history timeline that's at the spine of, of U.S. history, um, which is fine, and it's important for that to be there, um, but it does sometimes prevent teachers from taking excursions into other types of history, into cultural history, history of art, history of architecture, music, environment, um, and so that, I think there is something of a, that, that civic impulse um, sits on top of the curriculum structure in a way. Um, but, you know, that having been said, I'll, I'll, I'll say that, yeah, there is some civic instruction that happens in, in the U.S. history class because you, you learn where traditions come from, where traditions of self-government came from, um, how they've changed over time, how people have fought over them. Uh, and those are great stories that can be inspiring. They can be sobering, um, depending on where you're sitting in the present. Uh, but I think you know, for, for historians, one thing that, that these stories should be is that they should be humbling. Um, they are not uh, a partisan playbook or a moral fable that will predict the future or tell you that you're right about the various political positions that you hold in the present. And, and that's all right. And in fact, that's, I think, really important for there to be a place that that is happening uh, in K-12 curriculum. Thank you. Um... So during the live webinar, we got a lot of questions right away about the how of teaching. Um, and I am wondering, were you able to get a sense at all about how teachers teach the material that you sifted through? Is it mostly lecture? How student-centered is it? Is it inquiry? Um, we have a lot of questions about this how. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great question, and and it, and your your questioners are probably sensing that um, uh, our our report will disappoint in a certain sense on that front because we do not visit classrooms, we do not watch the, the you know the the curriculum being enacted um, with students. Um, so so and so when I hope that you know people will continue to take this research initiative forward and and do work like that, um, and people do you know, certainly do that type of type of research. Um, but I will say that there's actually, that there's there's an important reason to study um, what we might call the recipes of curriculum in the way that we are, uh, because that forms a common ground among these professionals. The teaching culture of the United States is defined in many ways by what resources they trust and what kind of guidelines and directives they're getting from their admins. So that set of recipes is what we study um, and, you know, as we say, there, there's plenty of good material in there. Uh, and, I, and I think there is, you know, one just to, to answer your question a little is, is that the format of many questions, uh, or sorry, many uh, lessons, um, especially since, you know, 2013 or so when the C3 framework, um, you know, came to be adopted and pushed um, by a lot of social studies um, experts and advocates. Uh, the inquiry um, buzzword is everywhere in curriculum, both in in the way in new textbook editions and in you know homegrown teacher materials. You can see that word uh, a lot of places, and you know we think in from a certain perspective that's a really thing because it is you know reinforcing the idea that historians have about history as a as an investigative process. Uh, as a way of thinking about evidence and argumentation. Um, so there's, I think, a lot of uh, strong suits to that type of uh, language in curriculum that we found. However, uh, we also noticed that sometimes that umbrella is a little too big um, and it makes space for a lot of bad questions that we've seen in curriculum. And so um, just to, to plug another uh, article that Witt and I and another colleague of ours, Lauren Brand, wrote in uh, Perspectives, uh, we have a piece called No Such Thing as a Bad Question, question mark, where we go a little more deeply into this notion of what, um, what kind of space is being made under the inquiry umbrella for questions that aren't really historical in nature. And those are the ones that we found ourselves a little frustrated by uh, and wondering what kind of path students are being taken. Um, under the inquiry uh, brand. So that's, 
you know, at least one way of answering this question of how. Thank you. Um, I also got a lot of questions on standards. Do you think that your research and other similar research can be used to guide states towards more unified social studies standards in the way that the next generation science uh, standards have done for the natural sciences? Well, I think as Nick uh, just mentioned, there is C3, so it's College Career Civic Life that came out in 2013, and we've seen that all over the place. We also seen many state standards that cite each other sort of in conversation with each other, but we take a cautious approach to this idea of um, standardization because history teachers can do a good job without this heavily scripted kind of paperwork. Um, and basically if we're empowering them to be lifeline learners in their content, and there's already this national culture of inquiry, of using primary sources, of teaching all of American history. And perhaps most importantly is that having a set of standards that are specific to districts and to states it allows us to bring in local history that connects their story to the story of the nation that lets students see themselves in their place that much more. And you're not going to get that with a national set of history standards. Thank you. Um, we got a lot of questions about the concept of neutrality in the history classroom and, and how that might have been captured in your research, um, how this concept of neutrality squares with the incentives among some historians or history teachers to view themselves as actively relevant to the present and whether um, acts of seemingly innocent simplification that you might have noticed uh, in instructional materials instructional materials, excuse me, are in fact where bias lives. Can you comment a little bit about this neutrality issue? Yeah, these are these are really great questions. Um, and and then that last point, which I remember seeing in the text of the question in the in the chat about how uh, political agendas live in the acts of simplification. I think that's really important to highlight. Uh, and I, I, we totally agree. Uh, simplification always moves in some direction or another. Um, but I think the, the question for teachers is, I think, um, what, what is it that constitutes the best self-defense uh, for a well-meaning teacher to prevent those simplifications that serve an ideological or political agenda, um, whether whether it's a you know right, left, or some imaginary center? Um, and on this, I, I do really think that what we hear from teachers, um, and, and that's all we have to go on in, in this research, um, those many responses that we shared about, you know, teaching students how to think and not what to think, uh, commitment to teaching the good, the bad, and the ugly, uh, race of multiple perspectives. Um, you know, these might sound like cliches to some people, uh, but they actually reflect a very practical self-awareness of this problem um, based in the need to tell history honestly and to be seen as trusted brokers in their communities. Uh, and I think, you know, it really does equip teachers reflective radar to sense when they or a piece of curriculum that they might encounter um, might be distorting rather than just simplifying the story. Um, you know, one of the questions uh, I think suggested that history class should leave room for and, and entertain uh, normative judgments um, while, while teaching, and I think, I think we agree. Um, but as, as we've written elsewhere, things can go wrong when we simply ask history to generate those judgments for us. Um, and, uh, you know, not, not all teachers and administrators are going to be perfect umpires, you know, on this. Uh, and we do note when they seem to ignore their own best advice. But, but in broad strokes, you know, I, I really found those responses from teachers uh, very reassuring uh, about how they see their duty in the classroom. I think that's good to hear. Um, and another question on standards. Can you comment a little bit more on the major similarities and differences you saw across state standards? And then can you talk about how these differences may affect the content that you saw? Um, and a related question, who is being included in these standards and in the content? Yeah, uh, this is a, a really interesting question and a complex question. Um, so, you know, there are differences between states on the level of detail of content when we're talking about standards documents. 
Um, when we went through all 50 uh, state standards, we, we had this kind of rudimentary uh, classification system where we tried to, you know, uh, label, uh, you know, just to get, just to get a grasp of the content, we tried to say, is this a content focused um, or skills focused document or both? Um, and when we were, when, what I mean by content focused is, you know, is it, you know, the, the ordered lists of content that the state is either recommending or requiring for coverage, um, you know, that and recommending or requiring depends on how much force is being put behind the standards. Um, and then skills focus um, focuses on the skills that students are meant to get out of their social studies education. Like, what are they supposed to be able to do um, when they get out of social studies education? Um, and, you know, uh, plenty of standards kind of, you know, uh, go across both of those. Um, why standards take their particular um, formats is highly contingent upon the process and structure of that particular state's bureaucracy. Like th there's there's lots going on on the ground that we can't necessarily speak directly to, but that that is what, um, you know, what produces kind of these differences. Um, but what's interesting about our finding findings is that content generally does not vary much between the states um, because of this national teaching culture that we've spoken about and how course sequences are effectively standardized across states. Um, where state contexts differ is grade levels for certain content. Um, for example, um, is the Revolutionary War going to be mandated in high school or just in middle school? Um, or uh, when those courses start, do they start with pre-Columbian societies or do they start with the Revolutionary War era? Um, and then how far standards go into the future? So, um, for instance, there are standards that go to the present day. That's It's just stated present day. But then um, in other standards, it's the Reagan era or the Cold War. Um, <clears throat> and so, and of, and of course, you know, there's the, it's relevant whether they have a testing requirement, the, those states have a testing requirement over certain content, um, like in Texas and Virginia, um, though Virginia has been kind of inching away from this state testing format towards other types of assessment. So um, as to who is being included in standards and content, Regardless of whether states have content-focused or skills-focused standards, many states have legislation requiring coverage of certain groups and individuals. And I was referencing this earlier um, in an earlier answer um, about uh, legislation. Um, and, you know, we have, you know, through our work, we have identified laws uh, mandating uh, Native American history, uh, Latino history, uh, history of disabilities, the history of women, the history of African Americans. Um, and there are waves of legislation when it comes to coverage of these social groups. Everything has a history. And when these um, uh, these laws come up um, is generally a historical process. Um, for instance, lots of states passed laws about the coverage of African Americans in the 1990s. Um, and in some cases, in, in certain cases, much earlier than that, but when we we're talking about waves of legislation, it's really happening in the 1990s. Um, and African-American history, um, that embrace of African-American history into the social studies curriculum opened the gateway for broader inclusion, where it's much easier and quicker um, to, to kind of get a, a response. Um, you know, if a, a group is lobbying for inclusion in social studies education, um, it's it's that process happens seemingly a lot quicker. Um, for instance, we see a surge of uh, in coverage of Asian American history after 2020. Um, we also, uh, you know, that, so that's an example of, you know, how states can be responsive um, to to these calls for inclusion. Um, but it can also be a controversial process. Um, LGBTQ history um, has been passed in. I think about seven or eight states, so uh, Nevada, California, Colorado, Connecticut, Illinois, New Jersey, Oregon, these are states that we've identified in our legislative database. Um, and it can be the site of a lot of resistance. Um, what, and, and if it's controversial, if it's like, you know, even if the state calls for its inclusion, it can still be controversial at the local level. Um, and so, you know, we have seen and, and talked to teachers who say that they minimize things that they think are going to be more controversial. Um, but we've also seen that uh, we've also had teachers tell us that, you know, if they have pushback um, on certain content, and, but it's required in the standards, those standards actually empower them 
to say, I am teaching what the state requires. So, you know, and often that, like teachers will tell us, that is enough to often diffuse the tension. Um, so it, it can split both ways as to far as to how like include like inclusion can generate um, uh, you know controversy or can it generate kind of a defense of well this is you know American history so yeah. Thank you. Um, I, we have a lot of professional historians in the audience and um, professional historians who want to help teachers. Um, and one question is, how can local history institution, institutions strengthen social studies education, particularly in areas where teachers are struggling? Um, this is a great question um, and, and one that I'm, I'm really happy to see that was asked. Um, so there are two ways. There, there are kind of two ways you can approach this question. You can take our survey results, which outline where teachers feel shakiest with their content. Um, and, and design around that. But I recommend local history institutions meet and talk with um, your teachers and ask them where they need help with their content and ask how you can support the national narratives that they're charged with um, you know, uh, teaching in the classroom and use local examples to speak to that. Um, you know, we've uh, had interviews where teachers were excited about local history institutions and were, and were rattling off names of institutions that they work with, but we've also had interviews where they could not name a local history institution. Um, and the difference in mood was stark. Um, teachers want to be connected to local institutions and, uh, you know, but you have to meet local, you have to meet teachers where they are, which is overburdened and at capacity. Um, I would actually love to see local institutions host professional development around sources in local history where teachers design the curriculum and emerge with units um, that they had input on to meet their needs. Um, if you are able to do professional development for social studies teachers, you're actually satisfying their district requirements um, while giving them tools and building relationships between schools and local institutions, win, win, win. Um, but the issue, of course, is money. And that's also a place where local institutions can organize to support history education. We have boosters for football, um, and there should be boosters for history field trips. Um, a lot of students go through their schooling without ever having a history field trip or site visit um, because of funding. And that's certainly a tragedy. Um, you know, COVID also has a huge role in this, and, and schools have been trying to build back up to the capacity to have field trips, but it's a very complicated process to come out of the pandemic. Um, and so it's, it's rebuilding those relationships is just going to take some hard work. Um, but again, we have to meet schools and teachers where they are, which is in a bind. Um, so there's a lot of hope and interest and desire for those kinds of relationships, though, um, with local histor history institutions and historians, and there's a real opportunity there. Um, thank you. Whit. As a teacher, I have to 100% agree with what you just said. I think the key for local institutions is, again, to meet teachers where they are and recognizing that there are so many constraints that teachers face. But then if you can, if you can manage that, then uh, you're providing a real, extremely valuable service. Yeah. Uh, we had a lot of questions about the methods of your work. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? How did you conduct the survey? What do you know about your respondents? Um, would your results vary if you included a specific demographic data? Uh, yeah, this is another great question and it's also a very complex question. Um, so uh, to just talk about the survey, we partnered with NORT um, out of Chicago to conduct the survey between April 2023 and uh, uh, August 2023. We sent invitations to take the survey to over 50,000 teachers um, who had taught U.S. history within the last year in grade 612. Um, that was the, you had, to be eligible, that, that's how, um, where you had to fall. Um, we ultimately surveyed 3,012 teachers which NORC estimates to be about 7.4% of all eligible social studies teachers in our nine states. Um, so all of our survey data is anonymized. 
the uh, but we do have uh, quite a bit of demographic data on our respondents uh, that's extensive um, for each of our respondents we know uh, the locale um, of where they are so if, if they're in a city suburb or town or a rural pla rural place um, we know the district and school population free and reduced price lunch percentage and non-white percentage um, we also have information through self ID about the participants gender race educational background and their teacher tenure um, so as you can imagine, this data gives us a lot of possibilities for analysis and is something we're still exploring and something for you all to look forward to in the full report. And I, I wish I had more that I could say at this moment, but we want to be very careful um, about the conclusions that we draw and we want them to be um, you know, supported and, and to talk about them as a team. And we, um, you know, we, we've only recently gotten the finalized data from, from that survey. Um, so you know, we and NORC, uh, took very special care uh, to ensure that the sample of correspondents who took our survey were a reasonably were reasonably close to representing the mix of locale types um, that I mentioned earlier um, that actually exist in each of our sample states. And so as you saw in the presentation, we've begun to cross tabulate these demographic and geographic data with specific survey questions to track how local context affects various aspects of history teaching. Um, and there will be more for us to report on this in our final report. And it's a lot of exciting information. Um, and that, you know, those uh, that being close to the re like a representative mix of locales gives us a lot of power to get more granular with our survey analysis and be more confident in our results. Thank you. That just makes us look forward to your final report even more, I think. Um, we had specifically questions on primary sources. In your research, did you find any state curricula that have a prescribed set of primary sources that teachers must teach at particular grade levels? Um, and if so, did those documents fall within the main topics that you already mentioned in the presentation? And did any of those documents lie within the subject that are considered contentious or politically divisive? Yes. Primary documents are everywhere in classrooms and there's some states have also put out laws that mandate teaching sets of primary sources. And one of the things that teachers push back on those laws is simply, well, we're already teaching all of this because it does cover all of US history. And so it's already be, being done uh, more or less. Um, Nick mentioned earlier that sometimes teachers will sort of maybe let the primary sources do a little bit too much work, just sort of almost like as if they're reading them, but most teachers and students are engaging them. They're using, they're asking questions and, and teachers are guiding students through those primary sources. And then the other troubling trend that sort of the, the shadow of um, English language arts of this exceptification of primary documents, sometimes students end up with such tiny little pieces of them that um, it's not clear how much meaning they, they can take out of them. And that's something that has happened in, um, in English as well. So, yeah. Thank you. I have a final question, and this is maybe fitting as the final question, since that's, this is sort of how you started off your presentation. A number of um, audience members asked whether it is accurate or fair to characterize pressures on teachers as coming from both conservative and progressive directions. Is that true? Or is one side more of a danger than the other side? Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, well, yeah, I, I think um, as as we do make clear, uh, the phenomenon of uh, politicized pressure is is a very localized thing, uh, and and again, really not the norm among the many teachers who shared their experiences uh, with us. There, there are teachers in the same school district uh, working uh, just a few blocks away from each other uh, who may have very starkly different experiences with either direct objections or perceptions of pressure over what they're doing. So it is really contingent um, on, a, on a lot of different uh, variables. 
Um, but I would say that, yes, it is true that uh, corrosive or distorting effects on history instruction can originate from impulses on the left or the right. Uh, and I think this is important from other positions, from kind of politically unexpected or inscrutable or incoherent uh, places. Uh, you know, we spoke to a, a teacher uh, in Illinois who uh, fielded a parent at a, a parent about the way that she had taught about the assassin of Franz Ferdinand. Um, this is not a topic that she expected would, you know, uh, provoke controversy, but there it was. Um, but I, I think another way to think about this is that history teachers, very much like the communities they serve, uh, they are a diverse bunch when it comes to their political sensibilities. Um, they may be strongly conservative or strongly liberal. Um, and I think in many cases, uh, some of those tendencies formed some part of their interest in history, um, it, it, uh, in teaching social studies or to teaching in general. Um, but teachers do tend to notice when their own side of the aisle, so to speak, isn't helping them do their job. Um, so we talked to strongly conservative teachers in Iowa who were frustrated with the negativity that that state's divisive concepts bill, which was a, a, a Republican initiative, had stirred up um, for them in their workplace. Um, and we also talked to self-described social justice focused liberal teachers in Washington state who were equally frustrated by these kind of trendy and performative uh, race talk initiatives that their district's very progressive administrators had pushed forward on them. There is a way that I think teachers you know, have to digest a lot of these political pressures um, with hopefully with attention to what their students can handle and what history is really about. Thank you. Um, I want to thank the entire mapping team again for a really interesting and rich presentation and equally rich discussion. In case I haven't made this clear, I'm super excited about uh, the publication of the final results. I hope everybody who is watching this is as well. Thank you again. And with that, I'm going to hand it over back to Jim. That concludes American Lesson Plan, Mapping the Landscape of Secondary U.S. History Education. We hope you found it helpful and productive. Keep an eye out for future events in the AHA Learn series. And thank you again for attending.